Chapter Four of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. The Beehives of the Alps. Pluck a hair from the head of your baby, stand it on end under a microscope, and split it lengthwise into five hundred strips. Now measure the thickness of each strip, and if your work has been absolutely accurate, you may have an idea of the exactness of the tools used in a geneva watch factory it was almost under the shadow of the palace of the league of nations that i went through a factory that has been making watches for one hundred and fifty years i found the workmen using micrometers that measure a hair as you might measure a log with a pair of calipers in order to prove this fact i pulled out one of the sandy gray hairs still left on my head and handed it to a watchmaker he found it was five hundredths of a millimeter thick and flattered me by saying it is as fine as the hair of a woman some of the screws made for the watches are smaller than the head of a pin and there are cog wheels with teeth as tiny as the finest grain of sand on the seashore indeed i had to use a microscope to see the teeth at all every watch has one hundred and seventy parts and the chief difference between large and small timepieces is in the size of their mechanisms this factory makes some watches not as big as your thumbnail no watch keeps perfect time but some made here vary only a second in twenty-four hours or just about six minutes a year if you will open the back of your watch and look at the flying balance wheel you may have some idea of what this means that balance wheel is making about eighteen thousand revolutions an hour and it travels thousands of miles every year if i remember correctly it goes eighteen miles every day nevertheless in a distance as far as from new york to detroit its variation is only five feet switzerland has been making watches for three or four hundred years for generations all the watches were manufactured in the homes of the workers only one or two parts being made at each house later factories were established and after the cheap machine-made american watch began to capture the trade the swiss adopted similar methods and turned out watches by the thousands where they had formerly made them by the dozens the united states has always been one of the chief buyers of swiss watches but we import mostly finished movements making the cases ourselves switzerland makes fine clocks as well as fine watches the stores sell clocks so small that you can carry one in your vest pocket and there are others so large that they are fit only for church steeples neither the watches nor the clocks are cheap yet i doubt whether the average timepiece of this country is any better than or even as good as our own in zurich in eastern switzerland where i am now the people devote their skill to textiles instead of to metalworking this is the weaving and embroidery center just as western switzerland is the watchmaking region the town of zurich does a big business in silk basel at the head of the navigation of the rhine on the border of germany is the chief place for the manufacture of ribbons not far from lucerne a great deal of artificial silk is made and st gall sends us hundreds of thousands of yards of embroideries there are cantons such as appenzell where the people have been producing handmade lace for centuries i spent some time last week at lake brienz on the borders of which is a village of wood carvers who make toys and other articles that are sold all over the continent in some families all the men have been wood carvers for hundreds of years on the south side of the alps the italian swiss are breeding silkworms and one district raises snails for the gourmets of paris the villages often specialize in single trades one town sending out masons or glaziers and another graduating pastry cooks most of the waiters and many of the best chefs and managers in the hotels of europe were trained in switzerland the tourist and hotel business is an important factor in the life of the nation the thousands of hotels represent an investment of about five hundred million dollars they spend on provisions and wages something like twenty million dollars a year and earn big profits in good seasons formerly the best patrons were the germans who came three or four times a year and spent freely now most of the money comes from americans 
I am surprised to find how important agriculture is in this land of the mountains. One would think nothing could be raised in a country all hills and hollows, but the truth is that three-fourths of the total area of Switzerland is productive. There are several hundred thousand farms, and it is estimated that there are a quarter of a million acres in holdings of less than 15 acres each. Every patch not covered with rocks or snow is either cultivated or used for pasture or forest. About 30% of the land is wooded and almost 40% is given up to grass. High up in the mountains you will find cows feeding on patches of green no bigger than parlor rugs and separated from each other by piles of stone. The cows are turned out in the mountains as soon as the grass sprouts in the spring and are driven higher and higher up as summer comes on. The people watch every grass patch and manure each one every year. When the automobiles began coming over the mountains, they feared that the dust raised would hurt the grass, and I am told that they often threw buckets of filth at passing cars to show their displeasure. Nearly every farmer knows how to make cheese, of which $15 million worth is annually exported. The 2,000 or more factories engaged in cheese making use something like 150 million gallons of milk in a year. The cream is excellent, but as a rule, one gets only hot milk for his coffee at the hotels. The Swiss also make a great deal of condensed milk and milk chocolate. From an industrial standpoint, Switzerland labors at great disadvantage through her lack of raw materials and coal. She has no minerals of value, and she has to import all the fuel she uses to make steam or electricity. The charges for coal are so high as to be almost prohibitive, and wood is practically the only fuel. An American woman who lives in Zurich tells me she had to pay $75 a ton last winter for coal. To make up for her lack of coal, Switzerland has begun to develop her water powers, and in time the white coal of the mountains will make her practically independent of the black diamonds bought at such exorbitant prices from France or Great Britain. The great hope of the country lies in the waterfalls of the Alps. Their force has been measured, and it is estimated that the power available is equivalent to about 4 million tons of coal every year, enough to run all the Swiss factories and railways and light every home in this mountain land. Within a few years, all the trains in the country will be electrically driven. They are already drawn through the St. Goddard and Simplon tunnels by electric locomotives, and the lines from Goldau to Zug, from Immonsi to Rothkus, and from Lucerne to Zurich have also been electrified. The total railroad mileage now operated by electric power is as great as the distance from Detroit to New Orleans, and in her total per capita water power development, Switzerland is second only to Norway. While Switzerland has a per capita foreign trade much larger than ours, the value of the goods she sells to the world comes chiefly from the skill with which she manufactures them, and she has to buy all her raw materials from abroad. In the hands of the Swiss, a pound of cotton becomes a pound of lace, worth 500 times what was paid for the material in it, and a few bits of metal are transformed by the workmen into a delicate watch of great value. The Swiss are among the world's experts in making the most of what they have, and they are one of the thriftiest peoples on earth. This little republic leads all nations in the number of its savings accounts. In a population of less than four millions, there are 2,600,000 savings bank depositors, and the total sum to their credit is almost $500 million. The canton of Geneva ranks first in number of depositors and amount of savings. And the Genovese cares so much for the pennies that a savings account may be open with as little as four cents. I am told that deposits of less than one franc are often made by the grown-ups and that the children paste uncancelled postage stamps in books and send them to be credited. This saving sense among the Genovese is proverbial. I think it was Voltaire that wrote of a woman who fell into Lake Geneva and was drowned. She was taken out, apparently lifeless. The rescuers moved her arms back and forth, but her heart did not beat. A mirror was placed on her lips, and no sign of vapor appeared. Her pulse did not throb, 
and her flesh was stone cold they were about to put her into a coffin when voltaire who stood by asked about her nationality he was told she was a genovese ah said he wait a moment i am sure i can bring her to life and thereupon he took a five franc piece out of his pocket and laid it in her open palm the fingers came together with a jerk and the silver was clutched tightly in her fist the woman straightway sat up and put the coin into her pocket i cannot vouch for the truth of this story but i should hate to risk a dollar that way to-day switzerland is the land of the apron and the patched pantaloon neither man nor woman is ashamed of work or working clothes every laborer has on his blue jeans and every woman clerk wears a nightgown like slip of white cotton covering her dress from shoulders to shoe tops the railway porters and the baggage men the street cleaners the grocers the butchers the bakers and the candlestick makers all wear something to protect their clothes while at their trades the mechanics wear aprons and every schoolboy and schoolgirl has a loose black overdress which buttons tight round the throat and catches the ink spots in switzerland there is no display for the sake of display and the people are democratic both in manner and dress geneva for example is a city of the rich and there are hundreds of families who live on incomes from their investments they have beautiful villas and their homes are wonders of comfort and beauty but everyone seems to dress simply end of chapter four